I'd like to begin this evening by reading a few scriptures from the book of Romans and chapter 14. Romans chapter 14 and the first verse, please. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. You'll notice the marginal reading, not to judge his doubtful thoughts. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God has received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own ma mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Chapter 15 and verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification, for even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore? Receive ye one another, as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. We trust the Lord will help us in this uh, subject uh, this evening, which is uh, a sensitive one, an important one, and we have to remind ourselves that real people are involved. Not just issues, not just principles, but real people, people with hearts, people with consciences, people with families, people with once bright hopes and perhaps some difficulties and struggles in their lives. And we want to remember that this whole subject is one that is dear to the heart of God. It's a matter that is a solemn one and an important one. And sometimes we're, I'm afraid, a bit cavalier and careless about dealing with one another. You know the famous statement regarding some who were very particular about breaking bread, but not too particular about breaking hearts. Now, we begin our study by thinking about what fellowship is. And I mention in my first sentence that no fellowship based on people will ever work. We're on page 29 of your notes. No fellowship based on people will ever work. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And when our relationship with the Lord is right, we will find that it will smooth a great deal of difficulty at the horizontal level. 
The Lord Jesus made this point to Peter when he said, if you love me, then you'll tend my lambs. You'll care about my people if you are in fellowship with me. So says John, truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And the old preachers used to use the wagon wheel. The closer the spokes get to the hub, the closer they get to one another. And so the unifying principle in the life of the local church is not how clever we are, not how much Bible we know. It's not even how holy we are. The link between every other Christian is the link of common life in Christ. And this will result in certain byproducts. This will result in, in uh, holy living. It will result in love towards one another. It will, it will result in wanting others to come in and to share the, the benefits and the joy that we have. But primarily, it is based on the principle of life. And so when we think about fellowship, this word koinonia, which is used very often in the New Testament, it speaks about a mutual sharing, a common interest in something, which may be a sharing in a truth, a burden, a common bond, a joy, a provision, a responsibility. And you'll notice a list of some of these names that link us together, fellow citizens, fellow heirs, fellow laborers, and suggestions following those titles as to what it is we have in common. Now, I want to keep clear in our minds the distinction between membership and fellowship. Quite often people will speak about local church membership, whereas the Bible makes it clear that membership primarily has to do with the one body. We are members of the body of Christ, members one of another, and that membership occurs instantaneously the moment we're saved. The moment I put my trust in Christ, I'm added to that body. I become a member of the one body. There is one body, we read in Ephesians chapter 4. And so I become part of that one body. By contrast, local church fellowship is not an automatic thing, is it? Uh, it's something that I decide to do. It's something that I make a choice about. When I put my trust in Christ, I become part of the universal church, but as we mentioned, the universal church does not have any meeting places. It doesn't have any elders. It doesn't have any functions on earth. It is uh, an invisible company of all redeemed souls by whatever name they call themselves, wherever they may meet, of both those who have already gone home to glory and those who are living from Pentecost until the rapture, every true believer is one with him. The whole family in heaven and earth. Isn't that a beautiful title? The whole family in heaven and earth. Now, that's something that happens the moment I'm saved. But when it comes to local church fellowship, uh, we recognize that uh, the impracticality of the universal church gathering and so we meet in local gatherings of God's people. And there are several, when we go back to the pictures given of the universal church, at least four of them are also applied to the local church. And so the idea is that our local churches, as closely as possible, should be a microcosm of the universal church, like the segments of an orange. Each segment bears the characteristic of the whole orange. It's not the whole orange, but it ought to be as like the whole as possible. And so each local fellowship should be only composed of those who are true believers. Certainly the universal church is composed only of those who are true believers. However, as uh, I've put in the notes here, sometimes the local fellowships include false brethren, Galatians chapter 2 and ungodly men, Jude 4. Also, of course, the references the Lord Jesus makes to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Now, my membership in the universal church is absolutely secure. The moment I put my trust in Christ, I can never be severed, I can never be parted from that wonderful membership. I am his and his forever. 
linked together, inextricably bound together, my life is hid with Christ in God, and I rest secure in that glorious truth. However, when it comes to the local church, there are reasons why I may be separated from local church fellowship through choice, neglect, uh, through unholy living, through circumstance, if I'm isolated somewhere, maybe in a prison camp or who knows where, a false teaching, man-made restrictions, assembly discipline, or by death. There are ways that we're separated from the local church. But as much as possible, all of God's people should seek to gather with those in local church fellowship. Some people are quite cavalier about this. They pop around from place to place, wherever the hot preacher happens to be, uh, maybe some special music, they stop in here, stop in there, and they are religious vagabonds. The Bible does not look kindly on such things because the local church is not simply an entertainment center. It's not some place where you stop by on occasion like a country club. The local church is intended to be your family. We're to pray for each other, encourage each other, help each other. Uh, we're to develop our gift. We're needed there. And the Lord puts people into local churches as surely as he puts them into the universal church. He gives us responsibility there in that local fellowship. And so the scripture speaks about um, joining ourselves or not joining ourselves to a local church. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Um, if you want to turn over to Acts chapter 9 and verse 26, you'll see there that Paul tried, he essayed, or he tried to join himself to the brethren in that local assembly, but they weren't sure that he was a disciple. And so they were skittish about receiving him. And so Barnabas heard about it. He went and got Paul, brought him over, and actually Barnabas told Paul's testimony, you'll notice, and he said, this is what happened to him, and I authenticate this, I agree with this. He's a, he's a good brother. And so we read, and he was with them. And he was with them. He essayed to join himself to the company. We have another occasion where we read in Acts 5 and 13. If you go back a few pages, you'll see the same uh, principle at work. Acts chapter 5 and verse 13. A little earlier on, we read that uh, great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. And so, verse 13, of the rest durst or dared no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. So there was a kind of magnetic field around the local church. And those who belonged, those who were true believers, were attracted to it. As soon as the disciples were let go after being beaten, it says they went to their own company. There was a, a magnetic attraction to be with the people of God. But just as with a magnet, if it's the other way around, uh, there, were, there was this influence that pushed away, too, that caused people, recognizing that the fear of God was upon the people of God, that there was a holiness there, there was a seriousness there, no one who wasn't a real disciple dared join himself with the people of God. So this idea of joining yourself, in other words, uh, casting in your lot, uh, laying down your life for the brethren, identifying with a local fellowship is a good biblical idea, isn't it? Now, I asked the question at the bottom of page, how do we decide where we should be in local fellowship? This is not an easy question. It's not an easy question because last time I looked, there is no perfect local church. There's no local church that you say point by point, yes, at every point, this exactly matches the word of God and these people look exactly like the book of Acts. 
Now, some of you may be offended by that and think that I haven't heard about your local assembly, but I think I have. <laughs> and um, you've heard the line, um, if there's a local church, don't join, a perfect local church, don't join it because then it won't be perfect. Well, the idea is this, that God has revealed his word and his word is perfect, but we're not perfect. And so we carry on in much weakness. We seek, I trust all of us, seek to be obedient to the word of God. But sometimes we have a kind of truncated list, approval list, you see. And so we think, well, here's what marks out the New Testament church. Um, all the ladies dress nicely for the meetings. Check. That's a good one. Um, uh, they uh, all uh, carry their Bibles and they... The gentlemen wear suits, generally dark suits with matching trousers, um, not, not too flashy ties. You know, the danger is that we start doing this. This is, I wouldn't say it's Phariseeism, but the idea is that it's external, isn't it? Like, do we say, well, actually, yeah, the Christians in this local church, they've all dealt with the issue of pride. They, they're not proud people. They don't gossip. They don't backbite. They don't complain. Um... They live uh, consistent lives in their business, in their family, and in the local church. They're the same everywhere they go. Now, those are the characteristics of the early church, too, aren't they? So sometimes we can have a little list, a short list, and we say, this is what makes up the people in our local church. They, they are on the A list because they've done all of these things. The fact is that in the early church, there were people who were weak in the faith, there were some believers who had just been saved. They came into the local fellowship, and they had this, um, they had scruples about not having a hamburger. We'd say they were weak brothers. I mean, you, you must be a weak brother if you can't have a hamburger now and again, right? Well, is that, that's the idea, that, that Paul is describing those who were received into the local fellowship. They may not have made it onto our list, because they still had some, as we say, grave clothes. They still had some, some things left over from their old lifestyle, and they were in the local fellowship. They were, they were weak Christians, and they were received. And they were not received so that immediately we could pounce on them and, and work out all the kinks the first week. You didn't receive them to doubtful disputation. In other words, you didn't bring them in and say, now listen here, we're going to get this all straightened out the first week here. So some of the things that we would have on our list, I'm not sure they had on their list in the early church. And there are other things that sometimes they were very serious about, and maybe we're not quite as serious as we ought to be about some of those things. So if the Lord Jesus was to take a visit to Northern Ireland and to go around the various churches that may be represented here tonight, I think there would be some who would have a very long bar. If it was bar graphs, they'd have a very long bar that says um, they understand what New Testament worship was. But they might have a fairly short bar on they love each other. Right? Well, loving each other is also a characteristic of the New Testament church. Whereas another group might have a fairly short bar on worship. They may not have understood much about that, but they have a very long bar here that says they, they do good works in the community or they, or they love each other or they, they speak to others about Christ. Um, they go everywhere preaching the gospel. Those sorts of things. Sometimes we, we have, as I say, our short list and we've made up the list because, well, we do those things on the list. But there are other people and they're doing other things better than we are, when it comes to the full-orbed portrait of the New Testament church, there are some things that we haven't put on our list as being very important, but God has them on his list as being important. And so other groups of Christians are doing things, maybe in some areas, better than we are. So when I sit down and say, now, where should I be in the fellowship of the local church? You know, in, in the New Testament, you will search in vain to find any sort of circle of churches. You won't find it. This is our group of churches, and we're, we're a cut above others. There are other churches. They probably are Christians, but they're not quite Christians like we are Christians, you see. 
You don't find that in the New Testament. So if we're going to stick to this book now, if, that's what, if that was the intention this week, to stick to what the book says, the idea that there are certain churches that we personally remove from our fellowship, well then we've put ourselves in the place of the Lord Jesus, haven't we? Because the Lord Jesus is the one who moves among the lampstands and who says, be careful or I may remove your testimony, but I'm certainly not the Lord Jesus. And no, no group of elders are the Lord Jesus and they have no right to say, this group of churches, we have removed them from the list. They are not on our list. This is, not, this is foreign to the word of God. We won't find it there. What we do find is the full revelation concerning the church. And when we go to visit in a local church, we look around and we start to notice that there are some things that they do and other things that they don't do. And the question really is this. Do they take the word of God seriously here? Do they take it as the standard, as the measuring rod for the life of the local church. So that if I were to sit down with the elders and say, now, gentlemen, I have noticed that there's something you don't, you don't break bread here. Uh, the early church, it seems, they broke bread every week. Is there a good reason why you don't do that? And they were to say to me, well, we're, and they plug in the name, we're such and such a group, and we don't do that. I see. So what you're telling me then is, you don't follow the New Testament as your, this isn't your standard. You have another standard, another code book, and that code book tells you how your local church ought to function. Is that right? Well, yes, that's the way it is. And this is how we do it, and if you don't like it, then obviously you, you, you wouldn't fit in here. Now, there are many groups that will say to you, we take this book as our only authority, our final and only authority. However, if you were to press them a little farther, you would find out that they actually do have a little book. It's not really written in pen and ink. They don't publish it. But it's an unwritten little book. And this unwritten little book has a whole set of extra things that have snuck in that you just can't find in the Bible. And that's why I say it's such a difficult thing to say, well, this is, I'm going to go to this local church because the fact is that for whatever reason, there just aren't a lot of places around where the Christians will say, if you can show us in the word of God something we're doing we shouldn't be doing or something we're not doing that we should be doing, we, we will be so grateful. And we'll get together and we'll search out that truth and if we see it there, then you can be sure that we'll do it here because that's what we want. We want to be not simply assemblies. Remember the term assembly simply means a group of people gather together with a common purpose. The mob at Ephesus was an assembly. They were gathered together for a common purpose. And so it's not simply are we, is this group an assembly? The question is, is it a New Testament assembly? And that means that they may not be doing it very well they may be doing it in much weakness. They may be stumbling along, but they want to be like the New Testament. That's what they want. That's their objective. Their desire is to be like it was in the book of Acts. And if that's the case, that's an encouraging place to be. They may not do everything right. They may be struggling with it. They may be having their problems, but that's what they want. And you know, that's really the key, isn't it? The question is not whether I'm a great Bible student or not. The question is, do I want to be a Bible student? Do I want to be a witness? If I have the want to, then he has all the resources I need to do it. So that's really the question. Do we want to follow the New Testament pattern? So that's a question that I would want to have settled. If I'm going to align myself with a group of Christians, if I want to follow the New Testament pattern, if I want to be a New Testament style Christian, then I'll want to fellowship with other Christians and they want the same thing. Now, if you want to belong to some other group who has another statement, another code, and they say, this is what we want to be like, and there are all sorts of them around, 
Uh, you can go on the internet and you can find on the, the web uh, churches that say this is what our church is like. They never bother to quote any Bible verses. It has nothing to do with Bible verses. It has to do with a particular model which they think will be very effective. It's quite pragmatic. We think we'll get a big crowd in if we do it this way. And that's their, that's their standard, what, what gets in the crowd. And I mean, they, they have other things in their list. It's not simply that, but they are driven by this idea that what they want to do is to be successful in the idea of getting a lot of people in. And so they have designed, I wouldn't want to say it's marketing, but it does have that flavor, a certain way of doing things that they feel will be the most effective way to build their church. And if you like that marketing approach, well, then that's probably where you'll go. But if you want to follow the New Testament, that's going to be a very expensive way to meet, isn't it? Uh, there, there's a great simplicity to it. And there's a great liberty in it. The scripture says where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And some people are afraid of liberty, you know. That's what the Lord is saying here in Romans when he says, the Lord shall make him stand. The Lord's in this thing. And so where we have liberty, we also have the danger of the abuse of liberty, don't we? And so some elders who want to protect the flock set about to legislate out all the areas where you might abuse that freedom. And in the process, of course, they also legislate out the freedom. It's like a Russian election. You can vote, but there's only one party, you see? And that way, we'll never be uncertain as to who's going to get into power because we've got that all settled. So where you have freedom, you may just get a young man getting up at the Lord's Supper and saying something wrong you'll probably survive it. He's a new believer and he doesn't quite understand things and, and he gets up and he says the wrong thing. Quite often, it's, it's an old man who gets up and says the wrong thing too. It's not just young men. But for, for this case in point, a young man gets up, he says the wrong thing. And someone might say, well, you know, that would never happen in our church. It never happened in your church because you wouldn't let any young man get up. You've got the whole thing locked up, you see? So when we have freedom, there's the danger, there's the possibility of the abuse of freedom. Now there are safeguards against the abuse of freedom. The Holy Spirit of God is there. Godly elders are there. The Word of God is there. And there are ways that we can protect the flock from the abuse of freedom. The Word of God makes that quite clear. But when we think about the life of the local church, we have to ask ourselves that question, what is the standard by which we measure a local church? It's a nice place. It's a friendly place. They have a large parking lot. Uh, they have a, a good uh, nursery for the little children. Uh, they have nice programs. That's how most people, I'm afraid, make their judgment on where they're going to fellowship. But what we ought to be desiring is a place that is like the design that we have in the book of Acts. I mentioned the other day that um, it involves responsibilities and privileges and submission to the elders of that local church. When we align ourselves with the local church, we're aligning the, ourselves with their joys and sorrows, with their challenges, their weaknesses, their difficulties. We have agreed to pray for them, to stand by them, to encourage them, to minister to them. We're in this thing together. Now, the question as to how the assembly determines those whom they will receive is an important one, isn't it? I think there should be a clear coming in to the fellowship of the local church. There are some churches, and whoever solders in, you're welcome, and there's no, there's no matter of uh, sitting down and talking with this person and find out where they stand spiritually. They're just welcome. Well, I appreciate the charitable spirit of those who receive everyone that walks in the door. But the word of God makes it clear that those in local church fellowship are to be people who are saved. And that those who are not saved, as we notice here, uh, should not be joined to the company because they are not part of the universal church. 
If you belong to the family of God, if you are part of the universal church, you should be welcome, all things being equal, assuming there's not false doctrine or there's, or there's immorality in your life, you should be welcome in the life of the local church. Why is this so important? Why should the elders take care in um, seeing who comes into the local church fellowship? Well, first of all, because the honor of God is involved. Secondly, because the elders are going to have to give an account for those souls. Thirdly, because of the damage these people might do to the flock. There are men who, uh, who are seeking to divide the people of God and gather disciples after themselves. There are, there are wolves, there are thieves and robbers and so on. The Lord Jesus described them. And so uh, the elders have been charged with protecting the flock of God and when someone wanders in off the street, we don't just receive a wolf. Wolves, they also love sheep, but for different reasons. Um, the shepherds want to protect the sheep from those who might damage the flock. So the honor of God, the uh, care of the, of the local church, and also the concern for the individual themselves. It's no kindness to treat someone as a Christian who's not a Christian. It's no kindness to um, uh, not know them and to know what their, their uh, problems and needs and concerns are. And so the elders, as they see someone who perhaps attends for a week or two or, or shows up in the area, and, uh, and we, we meet them and we find out where they stand spiritually. Now, this matter of reception is becoming increasingly important because the world is becoming increasingly litigious. I know one situation over in Kansas City where a woman was not uh, brought into the fellowship of the local church in a proper way. And by that I mean that if they have decided that they want to join themselves to this local church, then the elders need to sit down and say, you understand what that means. That means that we're going to care for you and we're going to discipline you. Discipline meaning um, everything that's involved in child training. It doesn't mean taking people out and shooting them. Uh, there are other parts to discipline besides excommunication, although some people think of discipline simply in those terms. But discipline means uh, all that's involved in child training. And so we're going to care for you, and if there are things in your life that need correction, uh, we're, we're going to correct you because we love you. And we're going to help you, we're going to be there for you, and uh, we want you to feel free to come to us and to, and to treat us as fathers, and we want to have a happy and healthy relationship with you. And so to explain to a person like this now, uh, there are essential meetings of the church, uh, there's time for uh, prayer and teaching and fellowship and worship, and barring a reason that's good enough to convince the Lord Jesus at the judgment seat, you ought to be there. Because if you don't, this is a balanced diet, you see, and if you don't um, eat your vegetables, you get sick, and then we'll be held responsible. So we want you to be there for these meetings of the church. You see, there are many churches, and if you stop in one, one service on Sunday morning, 40 weeks a year, and put a little money in the collection, you're a five-star member. But if you show up at a New Testament church and do that, they put you on the prayer list, you see? Because it's not just a matter of coming to a service. You've heard the line. Um, some, I was standing at the back of an auditorium at a conference with another brother, and a man came rushing in the door and he said, when does the service start? And my friend said, as soon as the meeting is over. Well, that's true, isn't it? We sometimes think of these interchangeably, but service is not me coming to hear the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, service is actually what comes out of my life after the Word of God has gone into it. And so we come to meet together to encourage one another, to teach one another, to pray for one another, to worship the Lord, and then we go out to our service. And there are all sorts of ways that we exercise our gift in service. So people who are coming into the local fellowship, we can't do this carelessly for this reason. This woman said, you did not tell me when I came into your local church fellowship that you would publicly excommunicate me for adultery or whatever the case happened to be. 
And so when she was involved in adultery and the elders decided that they were going to excommunicate her for that, she sued them for defamation of character, and she won. And she took their building in the settlement. And the judge had said, listen, a verbal agreement is a contract. And if you had sat down with this woman and told her when she came into the local fellowship, we want to care for you, we want to minister to you and encourage you and help you, if you do these things and you're not repentant, we will have to excommunicate you. And if you do that to everyone who is coming into the fellowship of the local church, you have every right to do it. But if you don't tell it at first, and then you sort of bring it out later, well then, you don't have a foot to stand on. If I go to rent a car, to hire a car, and I say uh, to this one company, how much? Well, 49 pounds for the weekend. Bargain, I'll take it. Ding, 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 that'll be 287.26. What was that? I thought you said 49. Oh, well, yeah. But, you know, there's some other things. I, I hate add-ons. I say, look, you're the most expensive. See you later. I don't want your car. So people come into the local fellowship, and then after we say, oh, by the way, you ought to be at the prayer meeting. You ought to be here. You ought to be doing this. You ought to be doing that. We need to do that up front. We need to tell people what is involved in the fellowship of the local church and be upfront about it. And then they come in understanding exactly what's involved and then everybody's happy. We, we're on the same page when it comes to fellowship in the local church. Now, there are two different situations, aren't there? There is what some people call occasional fellowship. In other words, there are people who are traveling, and there's a great deal of that going on today, people traveling from one place to another, and they find out that there's a local church in town, and they come and they say, I would like to fellowship with you while I'm here in your locale. And the question is asked then, on what basis do we receive others into local church fellowship? Now this is a very difficult thing. I understand that and I understand that elders um, are working in a sense blind, aren't they? they don't, maybe they don't know who this person is. They've come from uh, another country and they don't know what kind of local church they're in. They don't know if this person's a troublemaker. They don't know if this person is um, a, false, a false brother. They, they don't know who it is. And the elders are, are, are protective and they want to guard the flock and they're not, we don't want to be careless about this sort of thing because there are dangers out there from which the sheep need to be protected. If this believer comes with the recommendation of other godly Christians, and we have examples of it, we have um, Acts chapter 18, if you turn over there you'll see. Acts chapter 18. Verse 27. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much who had believed through grace. So here's a, a believer traveling from one place to another. The Christians where he is write a letter, send it to these Christians and say, please receive this brother, and he's received on the basis that he's a brother and that he comes recommended by the Christians in his local area. We have others, other examples of this. Now, I've, I've mistyped uh, a reference there. Uh, Wherefore, receive you one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. That's Romans 15, 7. We have the example of the letter of recommendation to introduce Phoebe to the Christians in Rome. And there Paul writes, I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister, that you receive her in the Lord as is appropriate for saints. So we need standards as high as the Lord Jesus has for his church. It's his church. The local church is his assembly. He's the Lord of the churches, not only the head of the church, but Lord of the churches. And this is his local church. We believe that. And he's the one who is the over-shepherd, and the elders are 
his under shepherds, and they are to do what he wants. And if he has received one of these, we should receive them too. We should receive all whom Christ has received. That's what the word of God says, right? Receive you one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So that the reception into the local church is based on our reception into the universal church. If I belong to the Lord Jesus, then I belong to the people of God. I belong to that family. Am I walking disorderly? Am I careless about the things of God? Well then, the Christians may have a little concern about me. They don't want uh, an undue influence um, to other Christians in the local church, and so they need to be careful. But at the same time, while we want standards as high as the Lord Jesus, we don't want them higher than he has them. And we don't want to refuse those for some reason that is not based on scripture. My first trip to Ireland, I don't know, maybe you're in the audience, I, I doubt it, but my first trip to Ireland, I was only here two days, and then I went over to Scotland, and before I could get there, a fax had arrived to tell the Christians there which local churches I had visited here, none of which were on the A-list. Okay, well, that's not a happy thing, is it? That's not a happy thing, because the, the basis of who is received and who is not received is going to be a very difficult thing to explain to the Lord Jesus someday. Now, what was the reason this person was not received? Was it because they were um, living in sin? Was it because they held false doctrine? Um, we need to be so careful here because the scripture could not put it any stronger, could it? when it says to receive those whom Christ has received. And in case we're wondering, the Apostle Paul, we already read the verse, the Apostle Paul said, do receive those who are weak in the faith. And so if there's someone who's weak in the faith, in other words, there are things that they don't have scruples about that they should have, or they do have scruples about that they don't have, if they're, if they're sincere believers, we don't put them out for that, we receive them. And we don't receive them so that as soon as they walk in the door we start to argue with them about the things that they don't quite have right. We bring them in to the enjoyment of the fellowship and we allow them to receive the word of God, we allow them to grow and we encourage them in the truth. But the idea that we say now you must keep all of these things before we let you in, I don't think that's what the word of God teaches. Because if that's going to be the case, then we have to have the whole list. And we have to say now, if there's any pride in your heart, if, if, you know, it's a long list, isn't it, of those things. We are not received on the basis of our light. We are received on the basis of life that Christ has received us. And again, I reiterate, the elders have a solemn responsibility. We do not want to bring wolves, false brethren. Uh, we, we have to be careful about these things. But at the same time, it is a solemn thing to refuse those whom Christ has received. You'll notice that there are very practical issues relative to life in the local church. The Apostle Paul says that we are to be honest with one another and confess our faults one to another and pray for one another that we may be healed. We are to seek to restore those who have grown weak in the fray, in the battle, to lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. We are to seek to exhort, to encourage one another. Three, the ABCs of what we're to be able to do. The scripture says we're to be able to admonish, we're to be able to bear, and we're to be able to comfort. Able to admonish one another. We need to find creative ways to encourage other people to go on in the things of God, to grow and develop. And that's a skill, a spiritual skill. It doesn't come naturally. You don't just walk up to someone and hit them over the head with things. You find creative ways to encourage people to go on in the things of God, to, to build friendships and to 
and to uh, reach out to them the way we would with our own children, finding encouraging ways to help them, not just simply uh, reprimanding them and rebuking them, but encouraging them when they do good things, do, do, when, when we do see positive change. And I think it's important for us to learn how to be able to admonish and then able to bear. We ought to be able to bear one another's burdens. Now, you can only bear one another's burdens if you know what burdens the Lord's people have. So we have to be willing not just to say, hi, how are you, and then be five steps past them, but to actually say, how are you, and mean it, and to hear what their burdens are, and to say, brother, let's pray about that right now. I didn't know you were going through this. I'd like to help you with that. I'd, I'd like to pray for you regularly, and I'd like to help you through this tough time. We need to be able to bear. And then we need to be able to comfort. Able to comfort. Uh, people say, well, you know, I, I don't like to go to funerals because I, I just don't like funeral homes. They make me nauseous. Well, I don't think anybody likes funeral homes except the people making money off them. But there are some things you just have to do. You have to go to the hospital. You have to be there. And, and maybe all you can say is, brother, sister, I, I don't know what to say. But I just had to be here. I'm sorry. I, I just, I'm just, I'm hurting for you, and I just, I just had to be here. It would, it would mean more to them than you spouting off a few empty platitudes. Just to be there, to be able to comfort. This is part of the fellowship of the local church. And then, um, provoking to love and good works. Isn't it great to have provoking Christians like that? Christians who provoke us to love and good works? When we meet Christians who have these nice little things they do. I was down visiting with a brother, his name was T.S. Morgan in Georgia. And we were out visiting, and then he looked at his watch and he said, uh, I've got to scoot back to the house just for a minute. And we went back to the house and he went into the refrigerator and he brought out a big cold container of lemonade and two glasses and some gospel literature and he had a little cooler that he put out by the carport. And uh, the people picking up the garbage knew every day, wherever they were, anywhere in the city of Augusta, they could come around to T.S. Morgan's house and there would be cool, refreshing lemonade and two glasses and a little gospel paper. That provoked me. That provoked me to love and good works, to think about ways that I could do that. There's an assembly in Blaisdell, New York, and every year they have a banquet. They put on a banquet, and they invite the volunteer fire department. Another year they invite the school teachers. Another year they invite the, um, the police department, and they give them a special plaque with a Bible verse on it to hang up in their in their fire hall or their police station or their teacher's lounge, which says, we appreciate you. We recognize you as being agents for God in our, in our society. And they have this lovely banquet and they give them each a nice presentation Bible and they say, we're here for your spiritual needs. We, we pray for you. And, and if there's anything we can do to help, we're here to help you. That provokes me to love and good works to hear about Christians who are finding ways to reach into their community, to help one another, to encourage one another, that's a good thing to do, isn't it? And then uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper in his way, the way he has ordained. That's a lovely thing, isn't it? When we all come to heaven together, we gather together very simply perhaps around bread and wine, and we rise up into the presence of God and we worship the Lord together in the beauty of holiness. That means, of course, that the Christians have spent time at the Lord's table during the week. The Lord's table is found, um, pardon me, yes, the Lord's table is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It is not the same as the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is the climax to the Lord's table. And when we sit at the Lord's table, we have been feeding, God has been feeding us with Christ and the blessings of the Christian life. And then we come at, to the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day morning, and we have something to give back to him. It's a beautiful thing. It's so encouraging to gather with a group of Christians who love the Lord and who have been feeding in his presence. Bearing the infirmity of the weak. The scripture says, comfort the small soul. That's the word feeble-minded. 
It's better translated small souled. Not everybody has the same capacity, you know. When my little girl comes to me with a broken doll, I don't say to her, honey, honey, don't you know what's going on in Iraq right now? Don't you know that Afghanistan's falling apart? Like the, the Middle East is in disarray. What is this about this little broken arm and the doll? That's no big deal. No. I take her at her level. That's a big deal to her. And so Christians in our local fellowship, we can't say to them, look, buddy, get over it. It's no big deal. It may be no big deal to you, but it may be a big deal to them. And so we need to comfort, to fortify, the word is, confortus, to add strength. We need to get alongside and help those who are small-souled, who don't have much of a capacity for pressure, for tragedy, for responsibility. They're a quarter-ton truck. I don't know what you have over here, but a quarter-ton truck with a half-ton load. And we need to get there and help them bear up under that load to comfort the small-souled, to warn the unruly. And this doesn't have to be in a rude way, uh, to take them out for a bite to eat and say, brother, you know, you have a, a way of upsetting the people of God. Have you noticed that? This isn't happy. It's not happy for you. It's not happy for us. Uh, can I pray with you about this? Is, this? is this something you feel this is your mission in life? Or <laughs> is there some way we can get past this? Because, because it's causing upset. You've probably noticed that among the people of God. And I care about you. I think you've got huge potential. And I want to see you to maximize the blessing of your life in, in, in the lives of God's people. We need to warn the unruly. We need to pray for one another, to encourage one another. Oh, the wonderful fellowship that can be had among the people of God. We need to show hospitality to one another. These are all areas in which the Lord calls us in what we might call the fellowship of gathering. And then I've mentioned very briefly at the end of that little section, the fellowship of the gospel, working together in the gospel, encouraging each other in our gospel work. And again, this is an area where I think um, we've, we've oversimplified the gospel in the sense that we say, this is how God works in the gospel. We, we get people to come to us. Again, you'll search in vain through the book of Acts to find anything like this. They went out with the gospel. And it wasn't necessarily just standing on street corners preaching. Uh, they found all different ways to do it. Um, Dorcas, she did good works in the community. And she got into the houses of the poor people. They were involved in all manner of methods to get the gospel out. The Lord Jesus would have a picnic on the seashore and he would give them the gospel. I was down in the south of England and I saw where the mine head had collapsed and the miners had turned it into an outdoor amphitheater and that's where a Wesley used to go and preach and the people would sit in the grass. That, that would be a relaxed environment to hear the gospel, wouldn't it? I'll tell you a little secret. I happened to go to some place recently um, where the gospel was being preached and um, I, I was wearing my other jacket, you know, that kind of light colored jacket and trousers that were odd trousers. They, it wasn't a suit, you know. And I actually had that, you see that wild banana colored tie I've got? It's quite gross. Well, I mean, God invented yellow too, I guess. But anyway, uh, I, I, I went, in, I, I guess I wasn't thinking, but I arrived in that garish outfit, you see, um, maybe some people forgive me because I'm from the colonies. But anyway, I came in and I was really intimidated. I walked up to the front and I just felt like I was so out of place. This was a gospel meeting. Now, I've spoken before 2,000 people. And I, I kind of understand the people who were gathered there. But I felt totally, I wouldn't say unwelcome, just totally out of place. And I thought to myself, if there were people in this town who were going to come in here. Now, what am I saying? Am I saying that, uh, that the brethren should all come in t-shirts? No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying that we have designed our gospel meetings the way we like them. We like to get dressed up, sit, uh, looking to the front. We like to sing hymns. We like to uh, have an opening prayer. And we like to hear preaching. 
But I wonder if the returns on that are really, I mean, are we seeing um, hundreds of people saved this way? Or perhaps we could begin to think again, and I know this is radical and it makes some people feel very nervous, but when, if we're going to open the book of Acts and look at how they did it, if we're going to call ourselves New Testament churches and we're going to do it the way they did in the New Testament, they went out with the gospel. They didn't, they didn't expect people to come in. And there was a pioneer evangelist over in Canada named J.J. Rouse. He wrote a book called Pioneer Work in Canada, and he has a whole chapter called Go Ye Into All the Assemblies and Preach the Gospel. It's not in the Bible. Now, is it wrong to use your building for a gospel effort? If it works and God blesses it, absolutely carry on. But it's not the only way, is it? And what we need to, to think about is not ways that we like, but ways that are effective in reaching the unbelievers with the gospel. I'm not talking about using tractor poles or mud wrestling, ladies and gentlemen. I'm talking about using methods that are consistent with the dignity of the word of God, with the gospel, and, and con consistent with the character of God. We want to do things in a, in a way that is pleasing to the Lord, that is right, but as I say, when we read the book of Acts, uh, they went into the marketplaces with the gospel. Uh, they went into the homes with the gospel. They went onto the street corner. They, they found all different ways to get out with the gospel. So there is the fellowship of the gospel. And the Christians in the local fellowship ought to want to pray for those involved in gospel work. They ought to want to encourage them. They ought to want to support them. But it's something that we ought to be taking out. It's something we ought to be, uh, the, where I've seen the most effective use of gospel work has primarily been inviting people into your home, opening the word of God, open hearts, open homes, open Bibles. That's the combination that I see being most winsome and most effective in reaching people with the gospel today. Rival fellowships. Well, I, I'm, I'm sh I should mention also the fellowship of grief. We've talked about that, caring for one another through the hard times, and the fellowship of giving. Uh, I don't make a big issue of giving. The Word of God makes it clear, and, and that's a subject that maybe we should have included. Um, simply to say that giving is a personal exercise. We should give proportionately. We should give faithfully on the first day of the week. The scripture says they gathered uh, to give uh, to the Lord. Um, we should give cheerfully, not by constraint, not because we have to. Uh, we should give generously. We should give thoughtfully and prayerfully. This is a privilege. This is part of the worship of the people of God as we gather together on Lord's Day morning. Rival fellowships. I, I simply mentioned to you this issue of rival fellowships, uh, an important issue. If we want to, to have a buffer, if we want to be protected, when new Christians, uh, are, when they're first saved, there's this strong pull to, to go back into their old lifestyle, their old friends, their old ways of doing things. And so one of the ways that we're protected from that is by clinging to the people of God, by getting together with God's people. I know one assembly that changed their midweek meeting to Friday night because they had so many people being saved out of the world, that was their night to go out. And there was such a strong pull, they said, well, what we need to do is to provide something for them Friday night so they can get together with the people of God. And I thought that was thoughtful and kind and very wise. Now we come to the subject of the importance of discipline, and I'm sorry our time is hurrying by, but I... I want to stress again that discipline means all that's involved in child training. But uh, this important verse that we have uh, at the top of page 31 from Hebrews 12, 6, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. The discipline of God is first of all an evidence of relationship. He only does it with his sons. Secondly, it's an evidence of love. 
And thirdly, it's an evidence that God has big plans for us. He's not content with us as we are until we are like Christ. So those are three great truths relative to church discipline. And when we think of church discipline, we are not simply thinking of the negative, we are thinking of the positive. That church discipline involves everything that's involved in child training, getting to know the children of God, encouraging them, rejoicing in their victories, teaching them, discipling them. That's all discipline too. And unfortunately, there are times when the chastening gives way to the scourging. Chastening is this word that speaks of uh, providing influence in a person's life to bring them along the path that pleases God. But there are times when they veer off the path and they get into trouble and they need something a little more strenuous to get them back on the path. Now it's always with a view to getting them back on the path. It's always with a view to restoration. And so this issue of local church discipline, uh, let's remember again, it has to do with real people, with real feelings, and we don't want to be hard or, or careless in this matter. Elders need to be very courageous in this because whenever elders act in discipline, some people will think they're too soft and some people will think they're too hard. They cannot discipline people so that other people will be pleased with how they did it. Let me repeat that. They cannot discipline people so that other people will, will, will be pleased with how they did it. Woe betides the parents who spank their children because they think other people who are watching think their children need to be spanked. We discipline our children for their good. And so there will be times when elders will go a little softer because they happen to know some extenuating circumstances. They'll go a little softer on someone and other people will judge them, wrongly judge them, and say, you were too soft. And the elders need to say, well, last time I checked, we were the elders, we'll give an account for this, we appreciate your assessment of the situation, but we'll wait until the Lord decides that. We believe we did what was right in the situation. Easy enough to have, as they call them, Monday morning quarterbacks sitting there with the um, ability to slow down the action and say, look at that silly quarterback. He could have gone right through that spot there. Look, I'll stop, I'll freeze frame it there. Right, right, see that? It's a different thing when you're the quarterback and you have 300 pound BMOS running at you and you have only seconds to react. Elders are working in real time they have issues that are coming down upon them. They don't have the luxury of saying, well, we'll just stop this action for a minute and we'll think about it. Very often they're in a situation where they need, they have limited information. Elders should not be Pinkerton detective, detective sitting at two in the morning with floppy hats out under the, under the <laughs> in their car watching to see who's going into whose house. Elders don't need to do that sort of thing. They shouldn't be doing that sort of thing. If there is sin, it will expose itself. God will expose it. And we need to use rules of evidence at least as high as the world does. There are some people who have been defamed and blacklisted, and it was all on innuendo. Watch out for that. We need to have evidence. And so sometimes the elders step, step back and people say, I know what's happening. Well, brother, what's your evidence? Well, I just know it. <laughs> well. Uh, you wouldn't want to be condemned on someone's hearsay, would you? You would want evidence, and the Bible makes it clear that there needs to be evidence. Sometimes, for example, a marriage starts to break down, and somebody says, well, quoting a Bible verse, it takes two to tango or something like that. But, you know, they're probably both guilty. Ooh, you be careful of that. Do you know that under the law, if you had given a charge of adultery against someone and you didn't have the facts and it wasn't true, you would be taken out and stoned to death? You'd be very careful of passing around charges like that. God takes that very seriously. So when we're dealing with these matters, the elders very often know things and are doing things that we don't know. And we say, why don't the elders do something? Well, they probably are, but they're not telling you because they're keeping confidentiality. And they may know things that you don't know. I've had people make judgments 
on decisions that elders made a thousand miles away. And I mean, they, they were quite sincere. They thought that they knew better than the elders who were actually sitting in the room with the parties dealing with the issue. And they say, well, they, they made the wrong decision. Wow. I'm glad you're omniscient, but most of us aren't. And you just can't do that sort of thing. Elders have to be given confidence. We have to trust them in these situations. Even though sometimes they may make mistakes, we, we pray for them. We pray that they'll be sincere, that they'll be fair, that they'll have wisdom from above and discernment. But when elders make decisions sometimes, they're, they're working with what they've got. And sometimes they will make a mistake. And I've been in assemblies where elders have got up and said, we thought we had all the facts and it turned out that we didn't. And now things are quite different and we're sorry. My father came into my room many a time, not, not every week, but I, I remember several occasions when he came in and said, son, I, I'm sorry, I made a judgment, I didn't have all the facts, please forgive me. I forgive you. That's, that's how it ought to be. But when elders make a decision relative to a, a church discipline, they're, they're making it, we hope, in the light of the judgment seat where the whole thing's going to be re-examined. And we don't have all the facts. And we hope that the elders do. Now, there are two purposes for church discipline. That is, this stronger form of church discipline, scourging. First is for restoration. All dis discipline has restoration as its prime objective. So the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and he says, put away that wicked person from among you. <coughs> but in the second epistle, he says... Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was afflicted, inflicted of many, so that contrariwise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such an one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Do we all know stories like that? Where someone has been driven away? They haven't been put out. They have been driven away, and there's been no effort to restore them, and they have been consumed with overmuch sorrow. They've just been overwhelmed with it and they've never recovered. So we must always think of this discipline as something that is intended to be purgative, restorative. But there is a second reason, and that is for the protection of the local church. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, and if we don't deal with sin, you know what will happen. Uh, people will lower their standards, and sin will become commonplace among the people of God. So we need to keep the standard high. The scripture says that others may fear. There is a sol solemnity. But when church discipline is exercised, it ought to be with broken hearts to put out one of our own, one of our family. It's such a solemn thing. It's such a sad thing. But it's with the hope. The valley of Achor becomes a door of hope. The valley of weeping becomes a door of hope. For what reason... Is church discipline exercised that is um, severe, more severe than merely the chastening, the child training? Uh, well, first of all, when a person is overtaken in a fault, <coughs> they fall into a sin. This is not the habitual practice of sin. This is somebody who's been ambushed. They weren't watching and they got taken out. And so when we see that, we see that they're repented. This is what Peter, wasn't it? Peter was following afar off. He wanted to be there near the Lord while the others were cowering behind locked doors. At least he showed up, but he wasn't ready, and he was taken out at the knees. There were three meetings between the Lord and Peter. First of all, the meeting of their eyes, and Peter's heart was broken, and he went out and wept bitterly. There was a second meeting, of which we know nothing. It was a private meeting between the Lord and Peter. That's how it always ought to be when there's a private issue between us. It ought to be private. We don't go around telling everybody, you know what he did to me, to sort of boost our case. Go to him alone, between you and he. Private meeting. They had a private meeting, and Peter was restored to the Lord. But then there was a third meeting, and this is very important. It was a meeting on the shore, and it was Peter's opportunity to get down off his high horse. He had said, though all these forsake thee, I will never forsake thee. The Lord said, Peter, would you like to reconsider? Gave him a chance to do some backpedaling, eat a little humble pie to mix our metaphors. And Peter was able to humble himself before his brethren. 
Sometimes a person who has failed uh, says, well, the Lord has restored me, so I just prance back into the assembly and everybody ought to just start where we left off. Say, well, wait a minute. The Lord wanted Peter to be able to work with his brethren again. And so he gave Peter an opportunity to confess before them that he'd been wrong and to downgrade his affection for the Lord in front of them all. And so there needs to be that too. If we've done something that has offended the assembly, offended the Christians, has damaged their testimony in the town, then we need an opportunity not only to get things right with the Lord, we need to get things right with the people of God and to tell them we're sorry for the damage that's been done to their testimony too by what we have done. Now, um, that particular issue, if the person is repentant, I don't believe there's any need for them to be put out of the assembly. It was a one-time thing. They were repentant. Um, in the case of Peter, the this, this situation that happened, and he is restored. And then uh, we have nuisance offenses, I call them, uh, plaguing the assembly, the unruly, the disorderly, the vain talkers and deceivers. Uh, loose lips still sink fellowships. Be careful of your lips. Be careful of what you say. The gossip on the phone, the backbiting, the criticism, these are dangerous things and we should see them as dangerous. And so when someone is consistently doing this, they have to be dealt with. We can't let it carry on. And the scripture makes it clear that um, we should not keep company with them. Now that doesn't mean that you don't see these Christians. It doesn't mean they have to be put out of the assembly. But it does mean this, that you don't go along with it. When they bring some charge against the elders, you say, excuse me, I can't listen to this. I can't accept a charge against an elder unless there are going to be two or three witnesses, unless you're planning to go with me, I'll go with you to see this elder. But I'm not going to listen to this criticism. I'm not going to listen to this. And we don't go along with it. That's the idea. We don't go along with it. When these um, speaking unadvisedly with their lips these people need to be rebuked and it needs to be dealt with. Now, as we notice, if it gets worse and they get involved in railing, in railing, that is, publicly denouncing people, then that becomes a cause for putting them out of the local church. And then offenses between two believers, I've already mentioned it, the initial stage, you go to the brother, if he doesn't listen, then... Um, you take witnesses, and if he doesn't hear the witnesses, then it comes before the church. Now, this is a solemn thing, and there are many offenses between Christians. We ought to be able to just say, well, that's okay, brother. I, just, I, I, I don't, I pay no mind to the thing. You know what it says about the Lord Jesus? Um, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. He just committed to, to him who judges righteously. Say, Lord, look after this for me, will you? And just carry on. This, the Lord's my collection agency. He looks after my unpaid bills. I'm not going to worry about it. I mean, if we, if we make a, a federal case out of every time somebody looks at us crossways, maybe they've got a, an ingrown toenail or something, and they, and they give us a dirty look at the Lord's Supper, and we just never get over it. Get over it. You know, when we're, we do this in our families. We don't make a federal case out of every time somebody snaps at us in the home, I hope. So I just write it off to, they didn't get enough sleep last night, and just carry on. There are so many things we could just put under the blood and say, you know, the Lord has forgiven me $50 million, surely I can forgive this brother 50 cents, right? What do you think of a person who, when the Lord's forgiven you so much, you grab him by the scruff of the neck and say, I'm taking you to court. And that's exactly what we have here. You're dragging them into the court of the church. You, there are a lot of things, if they're 50 cent deals, just forget it. Just get over it. And don't, don't make a big deal of it. This must be a very serious offense between two Christians in order to bring it before the church. Well, then um, we have the sad cases requiring removal from fellowship. Personal offenses in the advanced stage, if they won't listen to anyone, in other words, they force a showdown. They, they push their will on the assembly and they refuse to submit to the collective will of the assembly. In that case, what we're really saying is, you really don't want to be with us, do you? 
And so it's not, it's not ganging up on them. You're simply saying, this is not a happy situation. You will not listen to us. Brother, we're sorry, but we just can't, we can't allow you to become the issue in the assembly. What think ye of Christ is the issue, not what think ye of brother so-and-so and his pr private vendetta. So if you can't deal with it, brother, maybe you need to go away for a while until you, as much as in you is, live at peace with all men. It, it seems like you can't live at peace with us, so maybe you'd be happier somewhere else for a while. We want you back, but please, you're going to have to think about this. You're going to have to humble yourself and come back with a different attitude if we're going to get along. And that's, it's going to have to be a very serious issue here um, that brings us to this. And then secondly, home neglect, another solemn issue where a man is lazy and he won't work. He's worse than an infidel, not a person who can't afford to look after his family. In that case, um, the Lord's people should help, but somebody who is just indolent and he's just not going to work and he's expecting the Christians to foot the bill for him. A man like that is to be put out of the number. Again, with a view to restoration. And then uh, false doctrine, what a solemn thing this is, but you'll notice that in this case, um, a heretic must be warned and then warned again, and then on the third official occasion, he is to be put out if he won't listen. Now, when we talk about heresy, we're not even so much talking about false doctrine as we are talking about the reason behind it. It means to cause to divide. It's pushing an issue to get disciples after yourself. And that has to be nipped in the bud because otherwise you end up with him hauling off a bunch of baby lambs after himself. And the elders need to act quickly if there's a man. The scripture says subverting whole houses. It's not usually what he says from the platform because everybody's listening. He's taking people off to, to the restaurant or he's talking to them privately and he's, he's got a wedge issue and he's pushing it in and he's trying to get a following. Watch out for that. That's got to be nipped in the bud. And then... Um, moral offenses, there's a whole list of them, fornication, covetousness, idolatry, railing, drunkenness, extortion. This is not a complete list. Not a complete list because obviously murder is not on the list. I have extortion again. There should be rape. Uh, there are other issues that are not uh, listed there that obviously would be matters where there would have to be a public act dealing with it because it's a public issue in the marketplace out there in the world. We have to take a stand. Um, and the purpose again is that there be a repentance and restoration and we need to bring these people back again among the people of God. It's a solemn thing, isn't it? And yet we recognize there isn't one of us here that couldn't commit any one of these sins. In the wrong situation, it's possible, isn't it? And if we start getting this attitude, like I could never do that, then the Lord says, you need to consider yourself lest you also be tempted. You could have done the same thing. Covetousness, by the way, isn't just saying, well, I sure, sure would be nice to have that fellow's car. Um, these are public offenses. Covetousness would some, be something that led a person to embezzle or led them to tax evasion or something that caused a public failure, a public sin that affects the whole assembly. But again, the objective is the joyful restoration of all such. Well, we've gone over time, and I'm sorry. This is a, these are two very big issues, and I'm sure you've got lots of questions. Please forgive me for taking the extra time this evening. I really didn't know how uh, to, to treat it otherwise. I thank you for your prayers, and uh, shall we uh, just pause momentarily to commit ourselves to the Lord. Our Father, this evening, uh, we would like again to bring the elders before thee, especially elders who are going at the present time going through a difficult time dealing with problems in their local fellowship. We cry to thee, O God, give them grace, wisdom, discernment, and, and courage to do the right thing. Give the Christians the grace and the wisdom to support their elders and to stand with them through this difficult time. And give the offending party grace to humble themselves and to repent and to be restored to fellowship with thee and with the Christians. We pray for many who have been disciplined in times past and perhaps are still out wandering and have never been brought back. O oh God, help us to care about them 
and to pray for all such. If they're truly thine, they need to be in a place where they're being cared for again. If they have not yet repented, O oh God, bring them to the end of themselves. And if they have, may they be sought for and brought back tenderly and restored to the fellowship of thy people. We give thee our thanks for clear directives in the word of God as to how we ought to behave toward one another and deal with the affairs of the local assembly. Help us to follow these guidelines carefully and to be biblical in how we approach these issues. We commend all thy people to thee for this evening. Thank thee for this time together in the Savior's name. <laughs>